Hello. Hi, is this Ron? It's Ron, all right. All right. Well, let me do the official introduction, ladies and gentlemen. We are very excited to welcome our featured guest for this evening. He is a singer and a music producer and somebody who you remember fondly as the singing voice of the Archies. We're very excited to welcome Mr. Ron Dante to the show. You're on the air with Terry and Tiffany. Welcome, Ron. Well, thank you for having me, Terry and Tiffany. (laughs) You know, it goes so far back in my childhood. I was there when the Archies debuted, and I saw the Archies clip they played on the Ed Sullivan Show, and I have all the original albums. I'm just I'm just bragging as your number one fan here, Ron. <laughs> I even have all the cereal records. You remember the cereal box records? Sure, Sugar Pops. Yeah. <laughs> wow. See, your memory is better than mine. I didn't remember what cereal. I just knew I had them, but, but fantastic. How are you doing, Ron? You know, I am doing just fine. Uh, kind of locked in, like as we all he- are here. Mm-hmm. But uh, it's fine. I've been reaching out and saying hello to friends and uh, trying to keep myself uh, on a schedule because there's no schedule anymore. All my right. shows have been canceled for a while. But I'm fine. Nice to be with you. So you, you, you saw the Archies on the Ed Sullivan Show. Yeah, my, my mom called me that night and she said, you're going to be on the Ed Sullivan Show. I said, not <laughs> quite. <laughs> not quite. <laughs> it was so strange because I remember hearing that you guys are going to be on it. I kept saying to myself, even though I was a kid, I was saying to myself, how are they going to do that? And then they showed a clip from the cartoon series. I think the only other cartoon that was on Ed Sullivan was, was Fred Flintstone. Was yeah, on there. I mean, there weren't many animated groups out there that had hit records, you know. Wow. Well, I was just commenting to Terry before uh, we got you on on the phone here that it just kind of shows how bizarrely odd our connection to the visual is because you had a number one hit with the Archies at the same time that you had a number one hit with Tracy with the Cufflinks, but nobody knew it was the same guy. Yes, I I was kind of invisible. And everybody asks me, what did I feel about that? And I tell them I was fine with it. Uh, Every singer grows up wanting to hear their voice on the radio. Uh So I was blessed to have two hits at the very same time in the top 10 with two different groups and i knew it would be good for my career in the in the long run you know at the moment I, I, everybody's saying well you're not getting any attention i said yes but someday i'll get the attention mm-hmm. and uh, it was fun to do anyway well really you kind of got the attention with the cufflinks because where you of course couldn't do that with the archies you actually got to be on stage with the group and tour didn't you no we uh, i never toured with the group they put together a group and they sent them out to perform, but they would just lip sync my ah. record. So, so, so I was so lucky. I got to stay back in New York City while the groups, while the cufflinks went out. I, you know, I didn't care about that. And the Archie's cartoons were out there playing, so I didn't have to go tour with that. So it was very, very comfortable existence. I was uh, into singing commercials at the time, so it, it enhanced my jingle career. You're such a nice guy, Ron. That would have really ticked me off if somebody would lip sync in my songs. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I take things as they come, you there know. You go. I'm very, very fortunate to even be in the music business and, and be given the opportunity to sing and write and produce and do different things with my career. Well, you know, I want to thank you so much because I've always been a big fan. Like I said, I, I grew up as a child, you know, listen to your music and everything. And you really made me feel so good recently because I've, I've been seeing all the positive posts and, and that's what I told you I wanted to have you on for. It was because of all the positivity and everything you've been spreading, which we really need now. Uh, I mean, you know, putting songs up there that you did like Sunshine and so on. Uh, what's some of the fans' reactions been to you as far as the world and the way it is and how you've been making everybody feel better? Well, they like, they like the clips from the uh, Archie cartoons, and they love hearing some of these, these uh, happy songs. Yeah. Because they've, we made very happy, positive music because it was, it was basically for the preteen audience. So it was young and fresh and wholesome, and uh, that stuff is needed today because there's a lot of stuff that isn't, and, and that gets attention, that makes a lot of money, but this stuff uh, really lasts. And I must say, it brings a smile to a lot of people's faces. Uh, I've been getting great reactions. Uh, they, w- they wish they could see me in person this summer, but it doesn't look like the summer tour is going to happen with the, uh, with the Happy Together tour that I was booked on with the Turtles. I was going to be the lead singer of the Turtles again this summer. So it was a very interesting turn of events. It, you know, it, that's the way it goes. Right. Now, that, that actually is a good time to ask you, because I was going to ask you, I saw on your website that you had uh, 
a lot of dates that were listed. Obviously, everything through May has kind of been canceled, but you had a lot of dates that were listed in June. Do you know, are those still happening? Uh, all the June dates are going to be canceled. Mm -hmm. Mm. That's what they tell me. Also, uh, the, uh, the the Orange County Fair is has been canceled, and we were supposed to do that, I think, in July. So I don't think there's going to be a lot of shows on June and July. Right. Uh, we're trying to reschedule them all for September and October, but it isn't official yet. So we'll see. It depends on uh, so many other things, you know. Uh, our audience is a little older audience, and uh, we don't want to risk anything with our audience. Yeah. Right. Uh, also, also, the performers <laughs> are a little old on this, you know, so we have to be careful, too. They're not old, they're seasoned. You know? <laughs> that's right, thank you. I, I, that, that's my look, that's the way I look at it. Well, you know, it brings up a question. we got a very dear friend by the name of uh, Dave Ghosty. Uh, he's another DJ at another station on WFDU. And, and he was very aware of, of you being on the Happy Together Tour. I, I believe he saw some of those. He wanted to know uh, what the camaraderie was like with all the other performers and if you have any stories of the road. Well, basically, uh, we're, we're all old friends, most of us. Uh, a lot of us started at the same time and have met each other over the years, performed with each other. Uh, it, it's, a real, it's a real gang backstage. A lot of the artists watch the other artists' acts. Uh -huh. Instead of staying in their dressing rooms, they'll be on the side of the stage watching, uh, you know, uh, Chuck Nagran from Three Dog Night or the Cow Sills or the association or Mark Lindsay, we're all kind of uh, milling around backstage and uh, enjoying the show. So it, it's, it's a good feeling on it. And we also travel in a couple of buses, so we really get to live together. Wow. It, it, to think you might have shared a seat with Susan Cowsill. <laughs> I, I'm in love with her so much. She's Susan's a dream. She's a, she's she's kind of like the mama on the on the tour. She like helps people with their, with their costumes and yeah. whatever they're wearing. She she wrote, yeah, that looks good, or maybe change that color. She's she's a re really cool person to be with. Well, the guy I mentioned asked a question. Ghosty actually has a segment before uh, we go to you, and he was talking about uh, studio musicians that, that perform with the Archies. How a lot of those musicians were some of the same ones that was on like the Partridge Family and and different records, different artists. Uh, unfortunately, uh, you had posted on Facebook uh, not too long after you were supposed to be on last week, and I really want to thank you for allowing me to be sick last week. I, I really felt bad, especially when I found out it was your mother's birthday. It would have been nice to have had you on that night. I apologize for that. But I, I guess, come to find out, uh, a friend of yours that was a keyboard player and the Archies passed away. Is that right? Yes, he was a keyboard. He's a fellow who came up with ba 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 ba. Oh. He came up with that figure, and he played the keyboard on it. He also worked. Uh, he was a good friend of mine. He was the best man at my wedding. Wow. Uh, it was it, it it was tough. He had a bad heart too, so it it, it took him you know it took him by surprise this this virus. But his music will last. He he actually arranged uh, the Christmas record for John and Yoko. Really? Wow. Yes, he's he's the one who put the, a lot of the instruments on it. He he also was on the Monkey Sessions. Uh, he worked for Jeff Barry, a big time producer who produced uh, and wrote Sugar Sugar with Andy Kim. So uh, my friend Ron and I uh, went way back, and I was sorry to see him uh, pass, but he left a wonderful legacy. Yeah. And uh, he's got a really cool family and grandchildren, so they all, they all be taking care of him this week. And of course, for listeners uh, who don't know, we're talking about <coughs> Ron Frangipane, of course. Is that the way you pronounce his name? We get it right, hopefully? It, it's Frangipani. Oh, okay. uh, it's like the flower. And uh, it's so funny, he studied with Stravinsky. I mean, so he went from that, classical music, to pop music. You know, he arranged Janice Ian's first two albums. Uh, he, was, he was very, he, he had a lot of symphonics to everybody's records, I must say. But, the, you know, this was a terrible time for, uh, you know, uh, people passing away, yeah. I must say. Uh, but we have to marshal on and, 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 and honor them. That's the best way to, to remember them. That's for sure. I, I hope, I hope you're doing all the social distancing thing and staying in are you I'm, I'm like the boy in the bubble there you go <laughs> every, every, everything is delivered in and it's and it's left at the door stop and i go out in a hazmat suit and i wash it down and then i bring it back in uh no no i've been i've been hunkered down for six weeks and uh i am i am not going to get sick i i have to you know I, I'm, I'm right in that demographic where you might you know it might not be good to get uh, to have anything go wrong. Well, I don't want a tragedy to to end your music leg uh, legacy because I understand a tragedy kind of started. Didn't you like fall out of a tree and break your arm when you, when you were young and had something to do with it? 
That, that you, you're absolutely right. Uh, I was playing Tarzan when I was about 12, jumping from <laughs> tree to tree, <laughs> and I missed. Oh. <laughs> I missed a branch, and boom, down the, down the tree I went and busted my arm up really, really hard. And a doctor said it, said, you know, it's going to be stiff the rest of your life if you don't exercise it. You must exercise it all the time. And he sa- I said, well, what can I do? He said, well, you could squeeze a ball. I said, I'm not sure about that. He said, what do you like to do? I said, well, I'm a big fan of Elvis. There you go. He said, well, get a guitar. And I got a guitar. <laughs> and, and, and it changed my life. I, I never put it down after that. And uh, everything came out of playing guitar. It was amazing. I started to sing and write. I formed some groups, so yeah. But that that was a lucky uh, lucky accident. Well, I don't know if they ever imagined your parents, if they ever imagined that you would become, you know, as popular as you did with the the hit records you've had. Uh, what did your mom? You mentioned your mom had, uh, you know, it was her birthday last week, and and what does she think about everything that happened to her son? Well, they they were very supportive, very supportive. I, I used to sing when I was six and seven. Uh, <clears throat> imitate the local jo- Frankie La- Lane or Johnny Ray. They were the very popular yeah. in the early 50s, mid 50s. And so when I picked up a guitar and started to sing, they were very, very supportive. In fact, my father said, You could make a living out of that. He said, He had a shop that made coats. He said, Never come into my shop. He said, I don't want you to come in and take over the business. You go do this. You, you do this really well. So I was one of the fortunate ones where the parents didn't say, well, you better go to school because you're never going to make money in music. Right. I was very lucky they didn't say that to me. They said, you, you, you make music, you go ahead. Well, I've always known you as Ron Dante. I did not know your real name is Carmine. Yes, I was bo- you know, born very Italian neighborhood, very Italian family. But you know, in those days, the early 60s, all the Italian singers were changing their names from, from, uh, from you know... Uh, you name it. <laughs> they, they were like, you know, Bobby Rydell, you know, Frankie Avalon, mm-hmm. James Darren. Uh, everybody had long Italian names. Lou Christie. N- none of them used their real names. So it was kind of the thing to do was to shorten your name or give yourself a little sparkling name or something. And uh, it worked. And I, w- I was happy to do it. But if I had kept my original name, I might have, un- you know, ended up the head of the mafia. <laughs> <laughs> a name like, <laughs> name like Carmine. You know, have to watch out there. I, I was thinking Carmine, perfect for working in your dad's shop. Ron Dante, perfect for having gold records. Yes, I mean, it just yes. goes well, hand in hand. You know, I, I was called. I called myself Ronnie for years, and uh, for like five years till I was about nineteen, and uh, I was having a certain amount of luck with that name, right, Ronnie Dante. Mm-hmm. But uh, there was a record producer who produced the Four Seasons named Bob Crew. And, and he, I used to sing backgrounds for him on the Four Seasons records and some of the other things he did, like Oliver. And he was, he, was a new, he was into numbers. And he said, you know, your name doesn't add up correctly with Ronnie. You should shorten it to Ron. And your luck will change. And so I did. And sure enough, my luck changed. <laughs> well, let me tell you, Bob Crew and the Bob Crew generation, the greatest group of, of musicians. I, I mean, the perfect soundtrack, Barbarella. The, the album Barbarella. You probably don't know that, but uh, I love them. They're great. Bob Crew is great, yeah, for sure. Oh, no. He, the Bob, yeah, Bob Crew Generation producing Oliver, and he was the first one to take a song out of hair and make it a hit. He was one of the first ones to see that that was a great catalog of songs. Now, Good I've Morning ta- Starshine. Right. I've talked to you three times, and the one question that I don't think I've ever asked you is, okay, let, let's go back to the scenario when you wound up getting involved with the Archies. I want to know uh, if you were, I, I know you, you uh, basically raised the mantle high for Archie. I mean, you're always posting Archie images. You, I, you've handed out Archie trading cards. In fact, when I met you in person, uh, my daughter, who's the other host here, she was like, how old were you? At the time, I think I was like 12. And, and <laughs> you handed her an Archie's trading card that she still has. Yes. And, and I'd always wondered wh- how this came about. But more than anything, what did you think of when they said, well, you're going to be the voice of a, of a cartoon? I'm well, a singing voice. You know, when they, I said, well, what's the cartoon? And they said, it's Archie Comics, Archie. And I went crazy because mm. I grew up on Archie Comics. They've been around since the 40s. So when I was a little kid, I fell in love with Archie Comics. I loved Riverdale. I loved Betty and Veronica. My, my love went between the blonde and the brunette at least <laughs> once a year, right? Yeah. <laughs> So, so I was thrilled when Don Kirshner said, uh, you know, when I knew it was going to be for Archie, I knew it would be a, a Saturday morning cartoon show. 
I said, well, this is a great idea. They'll have music, a lot of music, and the music will be done by, uh, you know, Jeff Barry, who is one of the top songwriters of the 60s, right. along with his wife, Ellie Greenwich. So I, I knew it was a win-win situation. I was thrilled. And I also, there was something in my DNA that said, Archie Comics, Archie, oh, that's a great project. Mm-hmm. Now, I've got to ask you, let, you know, this is a controversial question. I, I'm just, everybody's wanting to know. Uh, things have changed a lot for Archie. And, and there's now a show called Riverdale, and the Archie comics have gotten much more adult. Have you seen Riverdale? What do you think of it? And what do you think of the direction the comics have went? Well, first let me talk about the comics. Uh, they changed the artwork. Uh, they a little more modern. Uh, the stories are a little more modern. Uh, they had to update their, their stuff. Uh-huh. Uh, it, it was a time capsule, and it was beautiful of its time, but I think they did a good job updating it, and they've, their subscriptions went up, and uh, you know, circulation went up when they, when they came out with these new covers and new stories, new artwork. As for Riverdale, uh, it, I, I love the idea that they have a band on the show. Yes. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's a good point, but it's a very serious show. Yes. And it's, it's, it's way different than, than anything. They just use the Archie uh, location and the characters. But uh, everything else has changed. Yeah. Uh, and uh, it's appealed to a great majority of the under 20s, I hear. Mm-hmm. I hear it's a very youthful audience that really likes it because it's been renewed for another season. And this will be, I think the fourth season they'll be on the, the uh, CW network. So be, they've been, they have to be very successful. So I'm glad in a way because some of the people coming to my shows are the, the kids that have seen Riverdale and, and, and just know about the Archies and they want to come see the show. Actually, on the Riverdale show, they did do Sugar Sugar once. They did a little bit of Jingle Jangle, my two first hits. And uh, they play an occasional, uh, as background, they'll use an occasional original Archies record. So it, I'm kind of up for it. I'm glad it's there. And that's what I was going to ask you, because, you know, a lot of people have the opinion that, you know, film remakes are good because it brings attention to the original. Do you feel that way about Riverdale? Because we had actually seen a clip. We didn't see a clip where they had done Sugar Sugar or Jingle Jangle, but we saw a clip of the band on Riverdale, the Archie's band that was performing. Music was totally different. Vibe was totally different. And and I'd actually remember looking at Terry and saying, the only thing that was recognizable in that was the logo on the drum kit. So, do you feel That's right. do you feel it's a good thing for the original Archies? Is it bringing attention to it? Uh, I think so. I, even that logo, <coughs> it's it's like uh, giving out information. Just seeing the logo is a good thing because mm-hmm. millions of kids and millions of people are watching the show. So it's co- kind of subliminal that they're getting you know this. But until the TV show has a big hit song, a big hit record, it's not going to compete with the original record. No. Right. Until there's this big song that comes out, which is very highly unlikely, because it did, you know the songs are good that they're doing. But you know, I, I, as a music producer, you know, I, I, I would change, I would change directions and go for better songs. But that's just my opinion, one man's opinion. So uh, the music is getting revisited. I, you know. Sugar Sugar, the video has been seen on YouTube hundreds of millions of times. Maybe 200 million hits on the Sugar Sugar videos in different incarnations. It's a lot of people mm-hmm. w- are watching it on YouTube, and along with all the hundreds of songs that are on there on YouTube. I've noticed people go back and watch them. Right. So it's a, it's a very interesting time to be the lead singer of the Archie. <laughs> well, I, I know I was talking to a couple of members, the two leads uh, of the Turtles, and uh, one of them was talking to some little, like, eight-year-old boy, and he was confusing the boy because he was telling the boy that he was a turtle, and the kid was thinking of a ninja turtle. <laughs> so do, do you ever talk to younger kids and they get you confused with a WB series? Uh, never. No. Never? <laughs> <laughs> Mainly I don't speak to kids. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, you had mentioned uh, your opinion as a music producer, and that's definitely something I wanted to touch on as well, because, of course, everybody talks about you being a singer and being with the Archies and being with the Cufflinks and things like that, but you had a very, very successful career as a music producer. I mean, you even worked with people like Cher and Barry Manilow, right? Yes, uh, and working with both of them was a dream. Uh, I actually started Barry Manilow's career. 
Uh, I was the first one to record him as a solo artist. Mm -hmm. And uh, I did an album with him before Mandy came out. We did an album that it was so and so successful, not really. And then that second album we did together had Mandy in it. And from there we had uh, six or seven years of success and uh, uh, hit records. We had 18 singles in a row that went top 20. So uh, it, was a, it was a very good uh, professional relationship between Barry and myself. And I love working with really good singers because I'm a singer. I know when somebody's putting out. Mm -hmm. I know when somebody really is bringing it to the mic and, and giving their all. And Manilow did it every session. He just, he had an, a natural, natural voice. And uh, he often surprised me at, with his phrasing. So it was a lot of fun producing him. Cher was a dream. She worked hard. We did with some cuts on the Take Me Home album. I've worked with some really good singers, John Denver, Ray Charles. Uh, I'm very fortunate to, to be in the studio with these wonderful voices. And they're really nice people. Nobody ever gave me any problems. Yeah, even involved you know, with you as far as being a singer, a great singer with, with the Archies, and I don't think he gets enough credit. And unfortunately, uh, more people should remember him is Andy Kim. Yes, Andy, wonderful writer, wonderful singer. Uh, the man behind Sugar Sugar, actually, uh, when he was called to write a, an Archie song by Jeff Barry, yeah. uh, Andy came up with the, the hook right away. He said, let's write a Sugar Sugar song. And uh, he actually played guitar on Sugar Sugar. Uh, he, uh, he had broken his pick, so he had to play the guitar with a matchbook. Oh, my. <laughs> and, of course, he had that, hits himself, like Lay a Little Lovin' On Me and things like that. He was, he, oh, know. he had three or four hits before uh, Rock Me Gently. Yeah. Definitely. Uh, you know, the, the thing ab about the Archie comic books and talking about updating things a little is they put out these dream comic books. And there was one they put out that I enjoyed, and, and if that could have only happened. I, I know that you knew the monkeys, and I had saw you one night at a Davy Jones show in Las Vegas. Uh, they had a comic book of the Archies meet the monkeys. Wouldn't that have been some kind of episode? That would have been fabulous. I mean, just, I, I wish that had happened. It would have been it would have been really cool uh, if 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 the monkeys were you know not angry because <laughs> 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 they were always angry that they were you know they didn't get their due re right. You know. I I'm, I was good friends uh, with Davy Jones yeah. and Mickey Dolans and uh, both of them super talented guys and really really uh, deserving to be th that group deserves to be in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame yeah. there's no doubt about it they were as big as the Beatles in the 65 66 67 around there. And uh, and their records were primo records, beautifully done. Done. Last train to Clarksville, still a great breakthrough record. So uh, yeah, but it would have been a great show. Uh, unfortunately, Don Kirshner couldn't keep all these groups together. You know that that's the thing too about Don Kirshner is, is he kind of has a, a rap or at least a, kind of a, a, a rumor going around uh, of. Uh, well, of course, there was tension between him and the monkeys because they they caused him problems and so on and so forth. I don't really know the story of everything that happened. I don't want to, like, tell tales out of school. But did Don ever talk to you about his relationship with the Monkees? I mean, what did he say to you? Because it was always said that the reason he created the Archies uh, TV show was so he could have uh, a group that he could kind of more control and not have to worry about egos and stuff. So I don't know like, if that's true or not. But Well, the cartoon wouldn't talk back. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> he did have a little problem with Jughead, though. He yeah, there, there you go. And it, Anyway, he did talk to me about it, because Don was my mentor. He started my career when I was 16, 17. He, he signed me to my first uh, uh, publishing deal mm -hmm. and, uh, and believed in me. And I remember walking to the Don Kirshner office early, and I, I realized it was music heaven, because w one cubicle was Carole King and Jerry Goff, and the next cubicle was Neil Sedaka and Howie Greenfield. Oh, wow. The next was Tony Orlando came out to say hello. Mm -hmm. All these people got their start with him. He was a great, he really knew how to choose talent. And uh, he, he would also, he also would say to me in a private moment how sad he was that that, that thing broke up with the monkeys. Yeah. Because all he was trying to do was make sure they had hit records. And that's why he brought in great songwriters and great producers to work with them. Because they were, they were a TV band at first. Right. Right? They were four actors hired to be a TV band. Right. And then it morphed into one of the hottest groups in the world. And and they and they they just wanted to control everything. So I I was a big big fan of their first records and their early records, first couple of albums. But I, I thought uh, Don got a, a short shrift on the stories. He's a really really good man. He he never hurt anybody. He always paid his people, 
and every he tried to give them two hundred fifty thousand dollar checks, all four of them, uh, each one, and they threw them threw it back at him. At mm-hmm. one point, they, they were very, so unhappy, mm-hmm. you know. You know, I, I dare say that they they had some good songs afterwards, uh, songs like Teardrop City and stuff like that. But a lot of people have said it. I think maybe I must agree with them that the best songs were the ones that Don was involved with. Well, they, he, he brought in Boyce and Hart <clears throat> and uh, Carol King and uh, Neil, Neil, Neil Diamond. I mean, talk about quality writing. I mean, you know, I'm a believer, still one of the classics of all time. Wow. Mm-hmm. Well, on the other side of the coin, we asked you about, you know, what Don said to you about the monkeys. I know you were very good friends with Davey. Did Davey ever say anything to you afterwards about Don? We would talk sometimes, uh, having drinks, and and it would come up. And he would, he always had a fondness for um, for Donnie. I, I thought he understood him because Donnie signed him as a soloist oh, yeah. before the Monkees. He was on Cold Gems, one of those labels. I actually wrote a couple of songs for Davey during those days because I was still working with Kirshner uh, in the publishing company. But uh, I always thought I always thought um, Davey had uh, had a little more compassion for what happened and if it was up to Davey they would have never left Kirshner yeah well I, I, I must that feeling. I must say you have my utmost uh, respect Ron because uh, we were both at the Davy Jones concert in Vegas and uh, while everybody was of course paying attention to Davey there was a, a group of people that had recognized you in the audience you were sitting right by us and you were very polite and everything but you were making sure they understood that they should be paying attention to Davey out of respect for Davey and I commend, I commend you for that. I really do. Well, it's, it's it's called professional courtesy, and also if you if you're friends with the act, that's the the worst thing you can do is try to get attention. Uh, I would never do that, and most of my cohorts would never do it. Debbie wouldn't do it to me. I mean, he was he, he was he was one of the great guys. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, the the thing is 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 the monkeys uh, have recently, and unfortunately, it was after Davey had passed put out a Christmas album, and I'd always wanted the Archies to put out a Christmas album, and it finally was released later on. Unfortunately, it wasn't with Tony Wine, but can you comment about the Archies Christmas album that came out, oh, a few years back, but not too long ago? Yeah, I was I was asked by some label to put together a Christmas album, and I think I thought maybe I could modernize the uh, the image, so I hired two teenage girls to sing on it, uh-huh. and, uh, and I, I, I had fun doing it, and I took a couple of solos on it, so it was it was an Archie's Christmas album, but it you know it's tough to it was tough it was when the music business was changing so much, the uh, CDs, you know streaming wasn't in yet there wasn't a lot of uh, money behind it so it didn't I don't think it got the attention it could right. have, but it was a lot of fun. But I do I do miss not having Tony Wine on it. But she was on the road with Tony Orlando. Right. She's she she performs with him everywhere he performs. And, uh, you know, because she wrote Groovy Kind of Love for him. Right. Uh, not Groovy Kind of Love, uh, Candida. Mm, and yes. uh, she's a very talented, beautiful singer. And like my sister, we both started in the Kirshner office as teenagers together. She was one of the first people I met there also. Well, you know, it was interesting because, uh, as Terry mentioned, I, uh, we're a father-daughter team. And so when I was being raised in the 80s, he introduced me to the Archies. And I learned all about the Archies. And I learned that... The Archies, even though it was a full band in the cartoon, that it was really Ron Dante and Tony Wine. But interestingly enough, uh, one of your guys' hit songs, I believe Jingle Jangle, you did all the female parts, right? Well, I did the, the highest verse singing. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why they asked me to sing that so high. I said, you know, this, you should just let Tony Wine sing it. She's doing the ad libs, because there are ad libs in Jingle Jangle, and she's doing those. You know, but she's doing the sing me, sing me, sing me. Mm-hmm. She's doing that, but I do the verses, and it was, it was, it was high. <laughs> anyway, I, I had a falsetto. I could sing falsetto like Lou Christie or or Frankie Valley, so uh, it was no problem to sing the whole thing. But it's a weird sound. It was a big. It, it actually made uh, sold a million. Jingle jangle. It's my favorite it, it, song. It's it's my favorite Archie song. See that it's it's a great hook, and and it and it's uh, got a great bridge section with the old come ons and stuff so I, I do it live I don't sing it in my falsetto live but I do enjoy singing it live it probably helps if you wear tight pants <laughs> uh. <laughs> I'm telling you it, it was high yes you, you know Don Kirshner got you into the cartoon thing and, and he did it again 
I didn't know before the cartoon came out that Charlie Chan could sing w- with his <laughs> kids. I didn't know. Charlie Chan and a Chan clan. I mean, uh, what do you think about uh, your work with that and the songs? They were kind of similar to the Archies, weren't they? Well, it was the exact same sound because I'm singing lead. I, I wrote all the songs with my friend Howie Greenfield, Howard Greenfield. So we put together 10, 12 songs for that series. It was the first Asian American cartoon series. There you go. On, on and, and it was it was very, uh, you know, it was well received, and uh, it was fun to do. I thought it was uh, just great. It was a, you know, it's a who done it, you know. It was a big every every show was a who done it, and the band was really cute. And they had the same configuration, same instrumentation as the uh, the Archies, but uh, that was also done for, um, on CBS by Filmation, right. who did did the original Archies. But that was a lot of fun to do because I got to produce and write and sing. It was so kind of strange too. I mean, unless they were they were going for an Asian audience, which what was a great thing to do because you know we needed to include that demographic. Also, I don't know if any kids in the '60s remember Charlie Chan in the old movies. They didn't. Yeah, I, I thought it, I thought it was a nice attempt, but it, its time had come. <laughs> <laughs> well, you've certainly been very prolific and done a lot of things, and uh, you're also known for one of the greatest parody songs uh, of the world, a leader of the laundry mat, and uh, you were part of a group called the Detergents. Yes, what an auspicious beginning <laughs> for a singer. <laughs> Here I studied, I sang, I did demos. And I do this one session with my two friends, Tommy Wynn and Danny Jordan, who were both signed to Kirshner at the time. So Danny's uncle was a, a, a hit songwriter named Paul Vance. He he had written uh, Itsy Bitsy Teeny Weeny Yellow Polka Dot Bikini right. and a couple of other big hits. He asked Danny to bring us into the studio and do this parody. So we did it in five parts, and we got paid for it. And about three weeks later, a record comes out called The Detergents. <laughs> and it's being played on the radio. And everybody likes it. And they say, well, you guys got to go on the road. And I said, what are we going to do? <laughs> they said, well, just, <laughs> just do some Beatles songs <laughs> and bring your guitar. And that's exactly what I did. And we toured for about six months with the Dick Clark Caravan of Stars. Wow. With Peter Noon uh, and Hermits Hermits, of course, and, uh, you know, Little Anthony and the Imperials. And we, we opened for the Rolling Stones in Philadelphia. And they threw things at us. It was like it was people did not want to see us. That Rolling Stones were there, <laughs> well, but yeah. the Detergents was a fun experience, and we did a very nice album. I actually got to sing a few leads in the album. That is a collectible album. The Detergents album. Us and uh, the <laughs> pictures are in washing machines on <laughs> the cover. I was so going to say you've had a very strange life, Ron. I mean, <laughs> it, um, strange, <laughs> strange. I well, anytime I get too big for my boots, my girlfriend says. Remember the detergent. <laughs> Never forget the detergent. <laughs> what, what's strange is you didn't get to tour with the Archies. You didn't get to tour with the Cufflinks, but you're there on stage with with the detergents. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> right? And they threw they threw our records at us. Well, oh, we gave wow. out we gave out free records once, and they threw them back. <laughs> it was it was but it was good because we got to work with the Shangri Las. Wow. Who, we we parried it right. So the Shangri Las were the first really. Uh, you know, kicking girl group. You know, they were kind of tougher yeah. than the other girl groups. Yeah. And Mar- Mary, of course, Mary Weiss was was just beautiful in the in the group with boots and long blonde hair. Oh yeah. She was, she was, so they were, they would do their song and then we'd come out and do our song and the audience didn't know what to make of it. <laughs> did, did, did they tell you what they thought of the parody of their song? They not a word was said. <laughs> okay. Well, that maybe that's not good. a word. All I know is Jeff Barry, who wrote Leader of the Pack sued Paul Vance, who wrote Leader of the P- Laundromat, and got all the publishing money. Ah. Be- because it was a direct rip. Right. You, know, it was, it, you can't parody something without paying the original. And, and wow. he got caught. I, I guess, uh, was it with the detergents, I thought? Or am I thinking of the couplings that you had said in an interview, it, it was the fastest album you ever did? Like, you did it all in like a couple of days, didn't you? W- four days, I did the Cole Cufflinks album. Wow. Cufflinks, yeah, okay. I did all the leads. And my friend Rupert Holmes came in and did some of the strings and horn arrangements at the time. So it was a very nice combination of uh, sounds on the Cufflinks album. The Cufflinks album that I'm very proud of. A lot of good songs and a lot of... Uh, I'm proud of all the work I've done. But the Cufflinks album got me to sing a little more, a little more mature yeah. a, a during those years. Just because there were more mature lyrics. 
Well, I'm so glad that you definitely got recognized as, as the uh, singing voice of the Archies. Uh, there was one show that, that really gave you recognition, a 1975 CBS TV pilot called Hit Patches, and you were on there as Ron Dante being interviewed by some up-and-coming group on, on how to be you know, a good pop singer and stuff, and they introduced you as the lead singer of singing voice of the Archies. Is that right? I, I don't remember that, but then again, I don't remember a lot of things. That <laughs> Me <happened>. either. <laughs> You know, but but I'm trying. I'm trying. I would love to see a clip of that. Well, yeah. if it is true, and if it did happen, and only uh, history buffs would know, it said you gave your advice on how to be a popular pop singer. What would that advice be? Well, gee, uh, it depends on the decades. Yeah. Uh, in the '60s, you had to have one sound of a voice. In the '70s, another sound. The '80s, tougher, more a edgy. You know, all kinds of things. '90s, you get lost. 2000 i mean it depends on the decade but if pop music is is a, is a catch-all phrase right now when i when i was on the radio with my records you would hear uh you know r&b records spiritual records country records uh, all on pop music mm -hmm. you know you would hear this the flying the singing nuns or whatever there was, a, <laughs> there was a whole bunch of things on the radio now nowadays it's very seg segmented uh rap has its own hip-hop has its own country everybody's like segmented i would say if you want to be a pop singer one of the key things is to sing every day to make your voice strong yeah and two is to either find or write a piece of material that will set you apart it's very very important write it you know if, if you're 17 or 18 write for the 17 and 18 year olds your your contemporaries things that things that you know you're thinking about they will think about right and try to put it to music uh, I'm very happy with what, you know, today's music is pretty cool. These guys like Bruno Mars and uh, Taylor Swift making very good pop music uh, in their own way and uh, tons of other artists around who can sing. Uh, it's just, it, there's always been a thing where 90% of the stuff that's out is kind of forgettable, but there's always that 10% that is going to be, uh, stay around right. and, and, and last. And, and each decade has its own. Well, do you think that, you know, songs like the Archies had and, and even, you know, the Cufflinks is kind of sweet, you know, Tracy and this and that, do you think they were popular because times were more kind back then? I mean, times today are kind of crazy and violent and everything. I mean, do you think if the Archies just came out today that it would be the same? No, well, I don't think... <laughs> no, I, I think the, the environment and the, the, the mindset of the population yeah. goes along with what's happening in the world. That's definite, yeah. Although, although... In 1969, we were in the middle of a Vietnam crisis. That's true. I was just going to say that. Yeah, <laughs> there were vets, people dying in Vietnam, and there were, pro you know, protesters on the streets. It was so. It was a very funny thing that "Sugar Sugar" would end up the number one song of 1969. How about that? <laughs> it was really. It just showed the power of a, of a nice song and something. People didn't even care about the lyrics in Europe, yeah. where it was number one all over the world. They didn't care about it. They just liked the sound of it and the beat. They could dance to it. But, uh, you know, it was a rough time then. Uh, it's just that, the, the, you know, songwriting is, has changed. Uh, it's more beats and, and themes. And uh, I would call a lot of the, the, the rap stuff, you know, rap music, uh, more like spoken word to rhythm track. Yeah. <laughs> Which is fine. It's its own, it's its own thing. Well, you, you know, if anybody ever asked me a question, they, they would ask me about interviewing people that do bubblegum music. And the one thing I have to tell people outside of, of you, at least, I don't think you're down on it. Most of the people and the groups that did bubblegum music seem to kind of talk down on it. Like they wanted to be a hard rock star or whatever, and they kind of got trapped in there. Like, for instance, our friend uh, from the Lemon Pipers and other, he was very bitter about being forced to do green tambourine and songs like that. But you're not that way, right? I mean, you, what, what's your whole vision and view of bubblegum and, and doing it? And do you think people should be ashamed of it or think it was kind of a, a joke or a parody? Well, let me first say, I wish I had that hit record, Green Tambourine. Yeah, yeah. That would be a great, I mean, that's a great record <laughs> and a really cool song. Yeah. You know, with the sound effects, everything they did in that. The, 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 the term bubblegum doesn't offend me at all. I think there should be a bubblegum rock in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame where they induct like five groups that did bubblegum music from the Ohio Express to the 1910 Fruit Gum Company to, you know, even maybe, maybe uh, T Tommy James or something. I don't know. Yeah. But uh, I've never been offended by it. Uh, I embrace it because we made music. 
Well, when we were making those records, we weren't making them for 20-year-olds. We were making them for 12-year-olds. Yeah. Right. We were making them for preteen bubblegum kids that chewed bubblegum. And we didn't mean to compete with The Who and Led Zeppelin and, and the Rolling Stones or any of the hip Jimi Hendrix. That, that, that was grown-up music. We were making music for young teenagers, just preteens and teens. So uh, I embrace it. I, I think it's a great thing. And... It's something to be honored, not to be put down. Well, yeah, it's crazy the way they look at it because I, I get these groups on uh, the Royal Guardsmen, and and we've had the the Fruit Gum Company on and other ones. And the association, association, yeah. And well, association was kind of cool about they, it. But, yeah, they were but cool. But a it. lot of them thought it was silly. But then I've had people that were kind of hard edged, like Arthur Brown. The crazy world of Arthur Brown did fire, came out like some god from hell, and he looked at himself as being rather sweet. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's kind of nuts, you know, the way they look. It's very interesting, but I'm, I'm glad you've got a, a good outlook on it. Uh, now, the one thing that I read that you did, Ron, that I've never gotten a copy of, never heard, is you put out a disco album? Uh, it, it had some disco. Yes, it was. <laughs> I finally got to use. I finally got to use. It was '79, and disco was at its peak. The Bee Gees were on the radio every day. Uh, disco Inferno. There was all kinds of great dance records. It was disco was a lot of fun. You could put a lot of types of music into that beat and make it work. So I decided to do a, a, create a group called Dante's Inferno, and we had a thing. <laughs> we had a hit. I love we it. Had, yeah, and we, and we did a couple of songs that uh, I was working on a Broadway show at the time as a producer, and it was called Ain't Misbehaving. Right. So I took a few of the songs from that catalog, the Fats Waller catalog, and put them to a disco beat. I hired the top disco arranger in New York City, a guy named Harold Wheeler, who's very, very famous, Harold Wheeler. And, uh, and I said, let's do a whole album of this stuff. And we had a lot of fun. And yeah. uh, we owned a small label, and uh, it was fun. I hired two girls to come sing with me. And uh, it was great. It was great to just to produce the album and get it out, because then it takes on a life of its own. You give it to the universe, and you see what happens. But right. I was very proud of that album. There's a lot of good, a uh, lot of good um, records on there. And just the whole Fats Waller to a disco beat. I've got to get on eBay and see yeah. if I can find that because that that's that's got to be great. Behaving. Check out Ain't Misbehaving and Ain't Nobody's Business. Uh, two two Fats Waller songs, and both of them are on. on uh, you can find them around. And I must say, they were, you'll hear the arrangement is right there in the middle of, like, this guy, Harold Willard, worked with Gloria Gaynor uh -huh. on, uh, on I Will Survive. He did some of the strings on there and horns. So uh, I, I had the top guys working on it. And then about a half a year later, disco just died. It was like, <laughs> all, of a, all of a sudden, they wouldn't play anything that had that beat, you know, <laughs> that, 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 that foot beat, uh, on, uh, you know, that, that everybody uh, arranged to. But, it, but for a while, it was... It was a very flamboyant and uh, successful uh, medium, I thought, uh, d disco. I must say, if you look at music history, I don't think people poo-poo's bubblegum as much as they do disco, even though there was some great disco stuff. I think so. I did yeah. disco produced some exquisite records and 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 town. the Philadelphia people did some great records. Yeah. I mean, you just got to you got to look at it and say, wow, this this was a very creative time. Uh, but uh, yeah, uh, disco people <laughs> people either hate it or love it. <laughs> now, knowing you're so versatile, I gotta find out. We talked about your work uh, with the Turtles. Of course, they've they've got a huge legacy, great hits that they've they've had. When you come and you sing for them, do you try to emulate their style the way they originally did, or do you add your own little flair to it? You know, uh, one thing I wanted to do when I started to take over the lead in these live shows, like the last two summers. Uh, we did like 60 shows each year. Uh, I wanted to honor the song and the way it was done. So I didn't deviate from the phrasing that Howard had put down on those hit records right. because I noticed that there are people, most people are singing along in the audience. And if I deviate from that phrasing, they look at me like, wait a minute, <laughs> <laughs> wait a minute. <laughs> Howard didn't sing it that way. So I tried to get as close to Howard as possible. Yeah. And of course, my own sound is my own sound. Yeah. Right. So usually halfway through the concert, uh, M Mark Volman will introduce me and say, and I want to introduce our guy who's singing lead. He's Dante of the Archies, and the people go crazy wow. because they all know Sugar Sugar. Right. And then I do Sugar Sugar, and, and it's like it's a, it's everybody, we get together, the audience and I. But I, I try not to uh, add my own flair, t uh, spin to these, those hits because people want to hear the song the way it was recorded. 
They don't want to hear the new version. They don't want to hear a different key. Right. They, they want to hear the hit. And, and I've got to deliver. So I, I, I try to deliver every night. But, you know, I know there's, there's like a practice in, in music that a lot of uh, stars will re-record their own music, and I guess it's to get back the copyright or something. I don't even like it when they do that. You know, I, I like the original versions of stuff. Yeah, re-records never work. Yeah. Uh, never work because you can never capture the magic that was in that recording session the, the day it w or night it was recorded. There was something special about that, the, putting all those people together in a, in a studio, getting them to play it after rehearsing, 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 and they capture one take that works, that is the magic take. You can't reproduce it. it yeah. It's never going to happen. You've got to get the originals. And, and when you did like the songs for the Archies, were you like all together in a studio? Were you your tracks uh, separate with the other people not around, or was it all together? Usually, they did the uh, rhythm track, right? The mm -hmm. guitars. Then, uh, then Jeff Barry would bring me out in studio, and I'd sing the lead and get a great lead. And then, we, then Tony Wine and I would go out, even sometimes with Jeff, do the bass voice and do backgrounds. And then we'd sing all in the same night. Yeah. And then we'd all hand clap and play tambourines and shakers. Perfect. So by the end of the night, we'd have the finished recording. But it was done in layers. That was, the, that was uh, Jeff Barry's style. Yeah. Right. Uh, and it kind of worked because you could have fun with each layer. Well, I guess Jeff Barry provided the kind of false, not falsetto, but the deep, uh, deep bass Please. kind of voice for Jughead, too, in, in some of the songs you could hear. That was Barry, right? That was him, yeah. Yeah. Well, we hear a lot about Tony Wine. Uh, I also read the notes. I don't know if the notes are right, because a lot of times they're wrong. There was other girls involved, too. Can you mention the other girls other than Tony Wine, or was she the only one? No, no, there were a couple of girls. Uh, I, I'm sorry, I blanked on their names, but, but there was one other girl that came in and sang, uh, Who's Your Baby? Right. With us. And that was a very nice cut, also. And I remember uh, she was very nervous. Because she was, had to replace Tony Wine, yeah. who had done two albums with us, and uh, but she was she did a great job. I'll, I'll try to remember her name, but um, yeah, we just that was the only lead, other girl lead uh, on one record, and was not really lead a background. Yeah, Ellie Greenwich. No, no, yeah. Ellie, Ellie. She she sang some backgrounds years later, but uh. no, it wasn't Ellie. Uh, I'll come up with it. Yeah, and that's okay. Point. That's okay. Yeah. Yeah. You know, being a lead singer and and having you know the hits with, with the the lead vocals of the different songs you've had, uh, you had a big training too in singing uh, background. Uh, of course, you uh, performed with McCoys and Hang On Sloopy, Tommy James and Drag in the Line, and of course Manlow hits of the seventies. Do you think being a background singer enhances your ability to also be a lead singer? Uh, not always, but. <laughs> Sometimes, uh, sometimes if you're singing a background singer, you learn to blend, and blending too much is not a great for a, an original solo sound. Yeah. Sometimes, so I think it's, it's it's a it's a question of the luck of the draw for uh, background singing. It does give you uh, a professionalism because if you sing a lot of backgrounds, you're using your voice a lot. You're ready to sing and put something together. But uh, the lead voices have to be original sounding they just have to be original sound they can't blend you sometimes these singers can't do the backgrounds right because they stick out too much and all the other background singers go shut up move back from the mic quiet you know it's just it's <laughs> something about that uh, I've, I've found that a lot uh, also growing up in the jingle industry i did a lot of commercials i worked with a lot of commercial singers who were really good singers but they couldn't have hit records for some reason yeah can you name some of the commercials that uh, we might know you from? Well, I did thousands. Uh, I did uh, I'd Like to Buy the World of Coke, ah. you know, the, the real thing. I did Dr. Pepper. Uh, I, I was on Budweiser Spots. Uh, I was on uh, Sometimes You Feel Like a Nut. <laughs> 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 it's funny, when I sing that live, everybody knows Sometimes You Feel Like a Nut. <laughs> Sometimes you don't. <laughs> <laughs> and you know those commercials, boy, they can make you famous. Like the I'm a Pepper, who's a pepper, you know, made uh, made him a hit. He had a hit later on called Making It with David yeah. Naughton. Yeah, for sure. That's right. That's right. You never can tell. Uh, in my live show, I actually put up videos of the commercials I've sung, and I sing along with them. So <laughs> I did that my first tour with the Happy Together Tour. I brought on, along six videos of different uh you know I, I call it you deserve a break today is i was on that with barry manilow actually ah. 
and I put that up and I sing that. You deserve a break today. It's like the national anthem of commercials. It's perfect. You got to work it though, Ryan. You got to get that product placement money. You know, I mean, <laughs> if I could, I would. <laughs> so to end this, and we've got to ask you this: uh, so many great Archie's uh, songs. I have all the original albums. Uh, there was one album. I can't remember the name of the album. There, there. You know, usually you saw the cartoon images. There was one album. It was a young man wearing a sweatshirt with the Archie's on a sweatshirt dancing with a girl. Who was that? Was that you? No, that was a model. Oh, okay. They they hired him. uh, That was like the very first album, I think. Yeah. One of the the very first ones that introduced the Archies. Uh, uh, Not the very first, uh, probably a second one. I think it was like the uh, second, yeah. Yeah, yeah, because the first one had the cartoon group on the cover, that great logo. Because for a long time, because, you know, I knew there was a man behind the voice because I didn't think cartoons were real. I wasn't that, you know, naive, but I, I thought that was you for the longest time. You know, I, I we looked alike actually. Yeah. I met I met him, and we could have been brothers. Uh, they, they, it just it was an accident. It was just a happenstance that he he got the gig to model for the cover. Yeah. But it just so happened that he looked a lot like me. I looked like that and during those years. The creator of the Archies, and there's a name that escapes me that we probably won't be able to look up. He had an issue uh, later on because they did Sabrina the Teenage Witch which, of course, was connected very much to the Archies. Uh, there even was a show joining the Archies with Sabrina. He had an issue with, with the actress, Melissa Joan Hart, because he didn't like some of the things she was doing, and she was uh, posing kind of provocative or anything. Did he ever give you any feedback uh, about the singing or, or the show itself, the, the creator, uh, right from Archie Comics? No, they, that was John Goldwater. There you go. And, and his son now runs it, uh, uh, Jonathan. Yeah. Uh, no, they were pleased as punch to have that. When that cartoon went on the air, their, their, uh, subscribe, their comic book sales went up to a million a month. Yeah. Right. They, they were having a great time with it. They never had any problem. They loved the idea that there was a hit song associated with the group. How many cartoon characters have a hit song? Yeah. Well, Sugar Sugar became their emblem. They, couldn't, they, they were overjoyed. And um, John, the Goldwater was a good man. Uh, and uh, and his son's running a very good firm now. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, you said some very nice things about the uh, the WB Riverdale show. What can we do to get you on as a cameo? They ought to put you <laughs> on and do something. Yeah, I I I would love to do something on the show. It would be a real inside bit yeah. for me to like end up as their manager. Yeah. You know? the, the manager <laughs> of the new Archies. What? How cool would that be? Yeah, you could be so, like a Mr. Kincaid on the Partridge family. <laughs> exactly, exactly. I'll take them on the road in a bus. You know? <laughs> well, you know. I, I would do it in a split second. So uh, maybe email the producers and say that Ron Dante should do this. And yes. That's all I can say. Yes. Well, you don't exactly know about the future because, unfortunately, your dates have been canceled. You did say on Facebook you're considering a Facebook Live. Are you still going to possibly do that? I'm, I'm working on it. I've got to coordinate it with uh, Mark Volman of, of, the, of the Turtles because I want to co- make it in conjunction with our, our possible shows later this year if we're yeah. lucky. So, uh, yeah, but I'm thinking of doing it. It'll be kind of fun. But, you know, between you and me, the sound isn't very good. No. The lighting is very good. <laughs> <laughs> and the set. You know, in your in your media room or wherever you are, is is you know, it just takes away a little bit of the magic. It does, yeah. Well, just, just to make make it so you're not so nervous. I mean, that's the way it is now. I mean, you watch the news yeah. and they're all from home and uh, Saturday Night Live. You know, they were all at home, so it, it might work. I know. Yeah, I know, but oh, that's true. That's true. Well, we were laughing because I guess on Friday on, you know, the local, because we're out here in California too, local KTLA News, the entertainment reporter, uh, Sam, was on there and he forgot to put his pants on. So, you know, <laughs> you know as long as you're fully dressed, Ron, you already have a leg up. <laughs> I, I'm going to do a, a, you know, a special pants off. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, we encourage all of our listeners, make sure to check Ron out online. You can visit his website at rondante.com, also thearchies.com. And, of course, uh, you guys can hook up with him and follow him over on Facebook as well, uh, where you can get updates on if and when this this live Facebook event is ever going to happen. Ron, it's always such a pleasure to talk with you. Thank you so much for joining us on the show again. Thank you, Tiffany. I'm glad we got to do it. Uh, re- reminiscing about this is so much fun. It, it, it's so great. You sound the same. You still have that youthful voice. The only thing that's different is I'm not sitting here with a bowl of cereal. <laughs> 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 All right.
right. Thank you so much, Ron. Please stay safe out there, and uh, we'll talk to you again soon. Okay. Nice, nice chatting with both of you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. See you later.